Which moves us to our action agenda. Uh, first up is number 12, action as necessary or appropriate on matters discussed in executive session. Do I have any motions? Mr. Hogan. Uh, I'd like to make the motion that we approve selected employment items shown in Exhibit A. Do you have a second? Ms. Snipes, any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion carries seven to zero. And that moves us to item 13, appeal of district review committee decision pursuant to board policy, KEC, library media center materials selection and reconsideration process and exhibit E. Dr. Ross, all right, so um, with this item 13, uh, we will hear from the complainant first and then the district Yes, so um, we will, we will, yeah, I'm sorry, we will hear from the, the complainant. I apologize. Ms. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Phelps. I don't think I like that term. <laughs> so hello, I am Karina Phelps. Thank you for the opportunity to appeal the decision of the review committee on the book A Court of Mist and Fury. I realized my unfamiliarity with the process exposed gaps in my initial submission. I will utilize my time with you to provide context in the hope my appeal could inspire this board to reconsider the decision of the review committee. My objective is to show that the material is sexually explicit and not age appropriate for our district libraries and that this finding is shared by other school districts. I had not read A Court of Mist and Fury prior to my initial submission. I had seen a video from a Lexington Richland II board meeting detailing sexually explicit portions out of context from the book. I found the passages on their own to be well below the bar for age-appropriate content for the age ranges served by the KEC library material selection. I have since taken the time to listen to the full audiobook, and I am glad that I did. I am 100% confident this book is not appropriate for our children and does not meet the recreational reading needs of grades 9 through 12. I had read reviews of the book, both public as well as published, assessing the reviews as confusing. Many reader reviews make note of the presence of explicit content characterized it as adult content. Published reviewers are also transparent about the presence of sexual content. Age ratings provided characterized as young adult with an age range of 14 and over, others setting the starting age at 17. Kirkus reviews used by Follett raised, rates the book 14 and up, but states, while their physical relationship is mutually pleasurable and graphically hot, the erotically charged lead up to the romantic storyline's climaxes, pun intended, adds stakes to the cliffhanger. A positive review of a book doesn't make the book age appropriate. Regarding the review committee's backup documentation, I'd like to address a few items that were provided in the packet to the board. In respecting this board's time, I can't address all of my concerns. Multiple sources use the term book ban. I will reference the United States Court of Missouri case CKW Wentzville School District uh, from August of 2022. The district policy does not ban the district students from reading the book at issue here, nor does it ban students from acquiring the books or lending the books to others. Students may borrow the books from the public library or from a friend or neighbor. They likewise are free to purchase the books. The policy does not even ban students from bringing the books at issue to the district schools, nor does it ban students from discussing the books at school during their free time or encouraging others to read them. It simply does not ban the books or anything for that matter. So the overwrought rhetoric about book banning has no place in this case. A school district does not ban a book when through its authorized school board, it decides to not continue possessing a book on its own library shelves. Uh, from the hub, only the headline was submitted by the review committee. In regards to a Virginia Beach case that states, judge in two Virginia book banning cases has dismissed the lawsuits. The headline leaves out important context to the lawsuit. I would like to submit a headline on the same lawsuit from the New York Times. Virginia judge dismisses case that sought to limit book sales. Two petitions sought to block Barnes and Noble and independent booksellers from selling gender queer and a court of mist and fury to minors in Virginia because of the book's sexual content. The case had nothing to do with a challenge in Virginia Beach School District, 
the omitted portion of the article goes on to inform the book, A Court of Mist and Fury, was removed from Virginia Beach School Libraries and Loudoun County Public Schools. Only this part was submitted by the review committee. Here is the article from the New York Times, and if the board would like, I printed the entire article if you'd like to read it, since they didn't submit it for you. Establishment of sexually explicit material. Definition of sexually and explicit from Merriam-Webster. Sexually is an adverb to sexual, meaning of, relating to, or associated with sex or the sexes, having or involving sex. Explicit, defined as fully revealed or expressed without vagueness, implication, or ambiguity, leaving no question as to the meaning or intent, open depiction of nudity or sexuality. There was a reference made in the Carolina News and Reporter in regards to my specific uh, challenge dated November 29th, 2023 from a review committee member, that Cornell Law School's definition describes sexually explicit material as having dominant sexual themes. The Cornell Law School references 10 USC 2495B and is military code for the armed forces on the sale and rental of sexually explicit material for commissaries. The article reports that this was read as a definition of what sexually explicit means to the review committee. If a review committee member is searching US military code to find a definition to justify a narrative in keeping this book in the library, they are not, unbiased, they are not an unbiased reviewer of the book's age appropriateness. From the Post and Courier article, written 11-7-2023, in regards to my book challenge, multiple review committee members concluded that explicit elements of the book were only a small part of the overall story. Multiple review committee members and I agree, the book is sexually explicit. As far as it only being a small portion, per the documents provided by the review committee, book list states, at times this straddles the line between young adult fantasy and adult romance. Farah is almost 20 and her sexual encounters are many and detailed. SJL supplied by the review committee, peppered with titillating scenes. From the ALA Selection and Reconsideration Policy Toolkit, the ALA general guidelines for librarians to follow when making selections. These books should be appropriate for the subject area and age, emotional development, ability level, learning style, and social, emotional, and intellectual development of students for whom the material is selected. From the South Carolina Association of School Librarians, School libraries serve all the students and do not operate with any agenda, only the desire to offer high quality materials to meet the academic and recreational reading needs of all of our students. Parents have the right to set reading parameters and restrictions for their own children. However, no one person or group has the right to make choices for other children. I would like to add context to this sentence as it would re relate to my specific challenge. Parents have the right to set reading parameters and restrictions for their own children when the material is obscene and sexually explicit. However, no one person or group has the right to make choices for other children as to whether they read obscene and sexually explicit material provided by the Lexington Richland Five School District. I'd like to share some of the book with you. Please note, this is more than a few pages of material and I can only read a small portion I know it was stated in an article, it's just a small, it's just a couple pages. It's far more than a couple pages. <sighs> oh, got stuck under there.
Do you consider what I read to meet the standards of the South Carolina Association of Library Librarians agenda to provide high quality materials that meet academic and recreational reading needs of all of our students? Can any of you provide the educational significance, appropriateness for students, of an in-depth description of fingering somebody, adding a second finger, plunging them in deeper and harder, bringing his fingers to his mouth, sucking on them, and tasting someone, being made available to children 14 and up in our district libraries? With good reason, this book has been removed from school district libraries across the country. It isn't only a couple. According to PEN America, 27 school districts have removed this book. And that was 20, 2022-2023. A court of mist and fury doesn't meet the KEC policy for material selection as follows. It doesn't meet educational significance, appropriateness for students in each school, such as grade and age level, and does not add value to the collection. Reputation of the author is not significant based on not meeting the first three. And appropriateness of the text of the South Carolina Department of Ed standard for library, uh, school library resource collections, age and developmentally appropriate for the students served or the grade definitions, high school standards serving grades 9 through 12. The Folat system shows the age rating by the publisher to be 17 and up. Whose rating should we use? The publisher who will sell less book with age limitations or the Folat system that will make a profit from the sale of the book? Goodreads has 17 and up, then lists the grade levels 10 through 12. So Folat system uses 10 through 12 grades rather than 17 and up? Does the Follett system shop around websites until it gets the age rating it needs to be made available in schools for grades 9 through 12? Book look age rating 18 and up. Common Sense Media 17 and up. Goodreads 17 and up. Backup documentation submitted by Margaret Adams and Carol Lunsford of Spring Hill High School from Follett says the book is rated age 17 by the publisher. This book is intended for an adult audience, yet the district has it available to 14 and up. In conclusion, the information I have provided for the removal of the book does not violate the First Amendment according to CKW Wentzville School District. Supreme Court case Pico versus Island Trees, Judge Brennan's opinion suggested it would be permissible for school boards to remove based on pervasive vulgarity. I have established the material per, per the Post and Courier from multiple review committee members that the book is sexually explicit and pervasively throughout the book based on the backup that they provided the board. The material is not age appropriate for grades 9 through 12 due to the age ratings and does not meet the standards set by the South Carolina Association of School Librarians, the ALA, or our district KEC policy. Thank you. And I would like to request that my written notes um, be put into the minutes of the meeting. Thank you very much. And, and just for the record, Ms. Phelps um, was informed prior to this meeting that she had 15 minutes to speak. Um, so I did not say that prior to you speaking. I yeah, didn't want no, to interrupt you, but <laughs> you did a good job. Um, so that will uh, bring us to uh, the district's response, and they also have 15 minutes to respond. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Ross. Thank you for this opportunity to share the work of the School District 5 Book Review Committee. My name is Carol Lunsford and I'm the Coordinator of Instructional Technology and the District Supervisor for Library and Media Services. In adherence with D District 5 Board Policy KEC and KECR, the District Review Committee conducted a thorough evaluation of the challenge material, A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah Moss. The committee composed of diverse representatives from Chapin High School, Crossroads Intermediate School, Dutch Fork High School, Spring Hill High School, and the district office engaged in a comprehensive review process guided by board policy KEC and KECR and independently read A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah Moss in its entirety. As we face book challenges like this one, it's critical that we trust the process outlined in board policy and the members of the committee that were, was formed to conduct the review. The committee diligently followed the instructions provided by board policy. As stated in our policy, the committee emphasized the importance of the freedom of inquiry that is vital to education. The evaluation process involved an in-depth examination of the material as a whole without extracting passages out of context. The committee considered the values and faults of the book and weighed them against each other, ensuring a fair and balanced assessment. If you'll please refer to policy KEC in your packet, 
You'll see under the section procedures for handling questions or challenge library center materials where it clearly outlined that we must follow these procedures. Various review sources were consulted during this process, including the South Carolina Department of Education Standards for Library Resource Collections, Goodreads, Amazon Reviews, Bloomsbury Publishing, Common Sense Media, Kirkus Reviews, Book Looks, Publishers Weekly, and several others, ensuring a comprehensive understanding of public and professional perspectives. I have provided a copy of each of these resources for your review. One of the tasks from the board was to determine if this book was in just one library, and it was not. It was in three libraries across School District 5, and six additional copies were purchased for the purpose of this review. Committee members also identified other districts in South Carolina who have open libra library catalogs like ours. This, this book was also found in Richland 1, Charleston, Lexington 1, and Greenville. Many other collections are closed to the public. Additionally, the committee discussed one additional district, Beaufort County, that has reviewed A Court of Mr. and Fury by Sarah Moss and chose to return it to the shelves. The committee then reviewed the South Carolina Department of Education Standards for School Library Resources and highlighted that 40% of the library's collection should be made up of fiction titles. Another committee member identified that there should be 15 books per student in each collection and that the librarians must know how to build a collection to meet the needs of their school. The book was chosen to be in the collection because it is written by award-winning young adult author and recommended by several professional library review sources as a good choice for high school libraries. It is important to note that this title is not required reading for any course in School District 5. The committee also identified the following while reading over several professionally reviewed resources. Best-selling author and title. The reviews have differing age recommendations, ranging from age 12 to 17, with the committee identified median of age 14. The committee's opinion was that the dominant theme in A Court of Mist and Fury is found through its literary value. Characters, thoughts, and age-appropriate themes for high school students included good and evil, strong female character, and the fantasy fiction. The committee then discussed the explicit scenes in the book. The committee reviewed the resource book looks and their rating system. A Court of Mist and Fury was rated four out of five on that resource and it was deemed obscene and sexually explicit. The committee, based on, the committee, based on the materials that were reviewed, agreed that the title is not intended for young adult adolescent readers and is intended for young adult ages, which included high school students. Committee members emphasized the importance of looking at the book as a whole, not sections pulled out of context, which was clearly stated in board policy KEC and that these scenes in the book were not dominant. The last resource reviewed by the committee came from a student perspective piece. The article shared student interviews regarding their opinions on book bans. Two students in the article referenced A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah Moss specifically. One student stated it changed her life and that she found, it found a book she could enjoy. It has encouraged her to read more. Another student stated that the, excuse me, another state explicit sexual activity and read it at age 11. No child should be allowed to read this type of book at that age. Per board policy KECR, the instructions to the evaluating committee state, the board directs the district review committee to bear in mind the principles of the freedom to learn and read. These are also available to you in your handout. The committees must base their decision on these principles rather than on defense of individual materials. Freedom of inquiry is vital to education and a democracy. The committee should study all materials thoroughly and read available reviews. The committee should check the general acceptance of the materials by consulting standard evaluation aids and local holdings in other schools. The committee must not pull passages or parts out of context. The committee must weigh values and faults against each other and base its opinions on the material as a whole. These instructions were the guiding principles for the committee's work. Therefore, after very careful consideration, the District Review Committee voted eight to one that a court of mist and fury by Sarah Moss is deemed acceptable and appropriate for School District 5 high school libraries, aligning with the district's policies and guidelines. Therefore, the committee decided to return the three original copies of the book back to circulation. However, parents and guardians may submit a request to school administration or the school librarian if they do not wish for their child to have access to any title within the library. In closing, I want to publicly acknowledge and show appreciation for the work of the Book Review Committee members and their service to School District 5. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. So I will open this up for a motion or conversation from the board. Ms. Huddle. Um, I move that we support the complainant and um, remove the book from all of our libraries, as well as all of the other books in that series. I vehemently second. Ms. Barnhart seconds. Would you like to start the conversation, Ms. Huddle? Thank you. Um, I, I um, when I found out that we were this, we were going to hear this appeal. I went to rent, rent. <laughs> That's old school. I went to get the li the book from the the library. I didn't really know anything about it at all. Um, and so when I went to get the book from the county library, the librarian looks in the computer and says, "YA." That book shouldn't be YA. I, I didn't know anything about YA, what that meant. And I said, what's that mean? And she said, young adult. That book should not be young adult. And left it at that, rented the book. I, um, I have tried to listen to it. I cannot get past chapter two, which is part of, of what was read. Um, so I did a little research, like why is it YA if this one librarian thinks it shouldn't be YA? Um, and I've, I sent some information to the board members, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but there was one part of it um, that I thought was really interesting, because I was trying to figure out, I kept running into reviews that say, said it had been re-rated from its original YA. By the way, YA is generally 12 to 18. Um, and so I, I was trying to figure out why do people think that it got changed. Um, and I ran, acro ran across an interview that said, um, Mass agreed, that's the author, author Moss, um, and said that we were now in a golden age of YA thanks to Twilight and the Hunger Games, but that ACOTAR, which is abbreviation for A Court of Thorns and Roses, which is the, the whole series, does skew a lot older. She was surprised it was shelved as YA, especially considering there is a three-day sex marathon in one of the books, A Court of Mist and Fury. But Moss mentions that new adult categorization, which by the way is 18 to 25, hadn't really caught on the way publishers hoped it would. She agreed to publish a court as YA as long as her editor would censor any of the sexual content. So, and I wanna you know, say one thing as far as you know, our librarians, there's no way they can read all these books. It's not possible. Um, so, you know, when you have a book come out as young adult, 12 to 18, and it gets some good reviews, I think it's understandable how it got in our libraries, uh, and I don't think there's any blame there. But it's, it, it sure looks like the publisher did that on purpose to make the book more marketable. And then people have realized that it's not age appropriate, and now you have Target saying it's 22 plus, Amazon 17 plus. Goodreads actually defines new adult 18 to 25 and gives examples of new adult 18 to 25 and this series of books is in the in the list. So my take on it is the book was misleadingly put in YA and that's why it ended up in our libraries. It is not young adult, it is new adult 18 to 25 and therefore I don't think it belongs in our libraries. Do I have anyone, Miss Barnhart? First of all, I want to thank uh, Miss Phelps for coming and speaking to us. I can imagine how grueling that was to have to read that, um, as it was for everybody in this room. And I want to thank the chairwoman for allowing her to, because we've seen instances like this so many times to where they're shut down and the full story is not told, as uncomfortable it was, as it was. This is a conversation we have to have, because I don't believe these are the only books, this series, um, currently or maybe in the future and um, given the the basis of it I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation um, given the policy you know the number one thing in the material selection criteria is educational significance what part of that book was educational um, I understand uh, the good versus evil the strong female characters uh, Ms. Huddle mentioned the Hunger Games Divergent series there's so many other books that show strong female leads that don't include sexually explicit content um, I noticed in this packet that we were given, and I'm not sure who put this together, but a lot of the reviews, 
shockingly enough, um, they're coming from the children's section. I mean, in, in two of these things, one was a children's uh, book council. This one, I'm not sure where this comes from, this copyright of school library journal um, review in the children's section. And I mean, right there in the review of the book, including some fiery sexual encounters. To put those two words in the same sentence is, I mean, is, that's a problem. Um, and I agree with Ms. Huddle that this entire series should, should be removed. Uh, when we talk about the banned part of it, because um, I've noticed in a lot of these reviews it has the word banned. This book is not being banned. This is simply saying that our taxpayer dollars should not go to funding these types of materials in our school libraries. I went and checked it out from the library like Ms. Huddle did. Um, you can go to Amazon. You can go to Books A Million. You can go to any of these places and get this book if that's determined, but I don't believe that our tax dollars should go to, um, to funding material like this. Um, I noticed in, a, in an article that was, came out uh, in, back in October regarding this topic, um, Dr. Ross quoted, you know, so we want to make sure that one opinion doesn't dominate the majority. I can promise you right now, Ms. Phelps is not one opinion. She represents the opinion of many, many mothers, parents, <laughs> anyone you can think of, um, with any general common sense that can, you can determine that this type of material is not appropriate. Um, so again, I want to thank Ms. Phelps for her incredible bravery for coming up and speaking about this tonight. Um, and I second the fact that these books should be removed. Thank you, Ms. Barnhart. Anyone? else have anything to say? Mr. Satterfield. Yeah, I have a couple of things. First of all, to the mom who got up there, I know that was nerve wracking. I, yeah, I understand. Uh, my wife has been up there before and she says she's never been so nervous in all her life. So um, I appreciate you. And this is part of the process when parents and community members do come and speak to us. I, I will tell you from, uh, an educator, retired educator's perspective to consider a few things. The first thing is we established a policy. The board approved this policy. And we, and the committee was made up of educators and parents, SIC chairs, uh, parents representatives from a lot of different schools. And uh, this was not a split decision. This was an eight to one decision. Now, would I want my 12-year-old to read this book? No, I would not. Um, but a lot of what we're hearing are personal opinions, and I understand we all have our personal opinion. When I was principal, I could ask, I would get a myriad of personal opinions from parents, as you might imagine, on a lot of different things. But this is not the world according to Mike Satterfield. If it was, we wouldn't have these things. You talk about sexual explicit material available to children, this has got far more than you can ever imagine. But that's neither here nor there. I, I do want to say that I understand your concerns, and I do believe that um, uh, some material is appropriate for some students and some material is not appropriate for others. But my, one of my other concerns is where do you draw the line? Where do you, the draw the line in what parents tell their children what they can and cannot read. You see, if we have books, I've heard, uh, I was looking, I, I, I did ask around to some other folks to get some other opinions. I asked teachers and some parents, and I looked to see what other districts had done, and there are quite a few districts that have, including Buford, I think, that at one time had like 90 books just automatically pulled off the shelf. And um, they did return the book to the shelf. Um, but a lot of folks, as offended as some of you all are with this content, a lot of people are offended with sorcery or talk of a sorcery or things that they consider um, against their religion. And they're just as passionate about those things. Um, again, we have a policy. We put this policy in place. We had the people, they were assigned to this. They came up with a decision, and um, I'm not, you know, again, I'm struggling with this, I'll be honest with you, but at the same time, why do we have a policy and why do we have a committee? And if the committee comes to a decision, why do we not follow their decision? So that's the part that I'm struggling with, and I know that everybody's got their own opinion about this. 
But again, parents do have the right. I know one parent said, well, parents, you do have the right to tell your children what they can and cannot read. You really do, you, every day. Um, but um, we have a policy, ma'am, well, this is not interaction. This is not interaction. Um, that would lead to chaos, as you might guess. We have a policy, we have signed the committee, the committee did their job, they came up with a decision, and um, I'm not sure that sends a very good message to the professionals and the parents that served on this committee, that if they came to an eight to one consensus that this book should be returned to the shelves, that uh, we're in support of the policy or their efforts. That is my concern. Thank, thank you, Mr. Satterfield. You're right, we do have a policy, and that policy allows uh, for the committee's decision to be appealed, and that's what we're hearing tonight. Um, I'm going to add my thoughts to this. I did read the book. Um, it's very long, it is very intense, and there is more, there are more um, sections of that book than Ms. Phelps read that reads very similar to um, that very uncomfortable two to three minutes of reading that information. I recognize that we have a committee. I recognize that you can have a cell phone and, and go and obtain really obscene information from a cell phone, from a Chromebook, from the television, from the news, from the public library, from a bookstore, from Barnes and Noble, from Books a Million for sure. I recognize that, but those are not schools. Those are not public schools. And we have a responsibility to have a fine line with certain material, and sexually explicit material is where that line is. We're not talking about all of the other conversations about books that are challenged or, um, or controversial. That's not what this conversation is tonight. Tonight is sexually explicit material, and um, and putting that information that, in my opinion, conflicts with state law at times uh, in the hands of minors, which is anyone under the age of 18. And that, I mean, that is where this conversation is. I understand that the book committee um, did a lot of research and spent a lot of time, and I respect their opinion, even if I respectfully disagree with their opinion. Uh, I think something that resonates with me tonight is someone who spoke in public participation talking about sex trafficking and the over-sexualization of our children and not being able to put things in context when they are reading materials. When I read this book, it's intense. It take, I mean, if you put everything collectively together, it is intense. So for, it, it blows my mind that an 11-year-old read this. I mean, an 11-year-old is absolutely not prepared for all of the all of the material that this is this covers. A, a, an emotionally sensitive 17-year-old, 18-year-old is not. I'm very concerned about them reading this book as a whole without having some type of oversight or someone or outlet to speak about what is said in this book. I'm not saying this book is a terrible book. I don't believe that it's a terrible book, but it is very, very uh, intense. And when you read any of the reviews um, outside of, I mean, I read the book, but if you read the reviews, all of the books say that it's, it is intense, it's suspenseful, it's provocative, it's sensual. There are all of these sexual descriptors about a book that we have in a public school uh, whether it's a library or not. And I understand we have an opt-out form, but parents don't know what to opt out of. They don't know what's in, there's thousands of books in libraries. How are you gonna opt out of books that you don't know exist if, you don't, if it's not put in front of you? Um, so, I mean, that, that's where I am on this. Um, I'll, I will open it up to fellow board members before we call for the vote. Ms. Ms. Snipes. Yeah, before we vote, I just want to uh, make a couple of comments. And I'm not here to change anybody's mind. I just want to be on record as sharing my position in response to a couple of things that have come up up here. Um, Mr. Satterfield said, you know, he's conflicted. 
And, you know, I'm not. I just, you know, I've had been very, had very open conversation with most, most of you and on my position of um, call it banning or not, taking books out of the library, um, out of the library. That's just what we're doing. I think that um, um, to Kathy's motion about taking out the entire series, I have issues with that because the entire series isn't up for debate. We haven't read all of the books. And I think um, regardless of how the vote goes tonight on a court of mist and fury, that that is a um, knee jerk reaction. I made uh, multiple notes um, as this conversation has been going on, you know, what is the educational significance of this book? I'm not arguing educational significance of this book, but let's also be clear that in our libraries, school and otherwise, all the books aren't there for educational significance. And I, and I feel like that's just kind of a, an additional cop out to kind of um, sway um, the way that we're um, leaning um, you know, into this book. I've also shared thoughts about different processes for when parents don't want their kids to read books. I agree, there are a ton of books in the library and it's hard to know what you can opt into, but I do believe that once books start becoming challenged, then they're on everybody's radar and parents can have the option or maybe we could look at them having an option for their kids to opt in to be able to read the book as opposed to asking parents I'm oh, sorry, as opposed to asking parents to, you know, to opt out. Um, I just feel like now we're getting ready to open up the floodgates um, um, for this. And like Mr. Satterfield said before, you know, where do we draw the line? And I hear you, you know, it's only this one book, but that's just today. Um, it doesn't tell us, you know, what's going to happen, you know, next month or whatever. And it was just important for me to kind of put, you know, where I stand on this and to follow up on your comment to thank the book review committee for their time um, and for their feedback. Um, and I hope that just kind of as a district and as a board, we can come up with better ways to manage this because um, something that has been repeated multiple times from the floor and from up here is um, taxpayers and parents' rights. Well, I too am a taxpayer and a parent, and I also have rights. And it just seems to me that sometimes we only care about the parental rights if they're the same rights or same views as yours. And I think that's problematic as well. Thank you. Mr. Hogan. Um, Ms. Snipes, thank you. Um, Ms. Phillips, thank you uh, for taking your 15 minutes and, and speaking. I know that was a little bit difficult to repeat some of that, but I guess the, the, the conversation that, that I want to stick on is that, you know, the, the line and where we draw the line, I think, in this particular situation is obscenity. And, and where I, I feel that there is, there's budget provisors and there's laws in place that, that keeps obscenity outside of school districts and outside of children. Um, where I think we're, we're really missing a lot of guidance from our lawmakers is just truly what constitutes obscenity. And in this particular situation, I feel I'm in a position to where I have to make a determination as to what I determined is obscene. And, and what I heard today was absolutely obscene. Uh, I don't feel it, it, it belongs inside the public education library. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Anyone else? All right, Mr. Mr. Scully. Yeah. So. What I'm hearing is really the issue is age appropriateness um, as far as the majority of the concern. Um, and there's a solution there. Uh, I was over 18 for the vast majority of my senior year of high school. Uh, my wife was as well. Um, a lot of students are 18 in high school. When you're 18, you can join the military Men have to register for the military. They're con uh, required to register for, for the military um, for war, to fight, maim, kill, and be killed in war at 18. High schoolers. When you're 16, we sign up 
to drive vehicles what, which are essentially weapons and we put weapons in the hands of teenagers at 16, 15 really, 15 and 16 years old, that kill kids and other people. That's a, it's a big gap for me to say that we can allow our kids, our high school students rather, our students to participate in those types of activities, but they can't read a book. And I know the argument's not about whether they can read it, but even when you look at whether it's available in the, in the public li or in the uh, school library, sometimes that is the only resource for certain students. We just talked about tonight um, the, the extent of persistent poverty. A lot of those families don't have the ability to go to their public library. The only place that they can even get their kids to go is to school, public school, and the only reason they can go to school is because they're picked up by a bus. So they don't have the ability to go to a library or go to a store, and even if they can go to a store, they don't have the money to buy a book if that's what they wanted to do. They're fighting just to be able to afford a meal. So any kind of subscription service that would cost money to have access to books uh, would be problematic. And that's not fair to our poverty-stricken families and students to take a book out of their uh, hands, out of their availability. But again, would I have my child, my daughter read this book? Absolutely not. But that's my right and my decision as a parent and I agree with what we said, or what others have said, that you know, well, number one, I believe in the Constitution very heavily, and I believe in parent choice. And just because I choose not to let my kid read it, I don't have the right to tell you that you can't, or that your child cannot. And I think if we remove it from the library, uh, the public school libraries, then we're doing that for uh, everyone. And that's, that's anti that's against parental choice. Um, so I, I, again, with you know whether or not it's taxpayer funded, I'm going to remind you the military is taxpayer funded. When these high school students get sent off to war, they're taxpayer funded. When we put them in cars, they're driving the car because they got a taxpayer funded driver's license. So that's not an uh, that's not a reason. That's an excuse. And so I don't agree that, that that pertains in this case. I understand the sentiment. So I also agree with Ms. Snipes that it's not the whole series that, that's up for debate tonight, so we should not be banning a book that we have not re read, which is what the additional books are. That's, not, that's out of our scope tonight. Um, so I'm going to make an um, amendment to the motion uh, to that I move to only make, uh, to make the book, the subject book, available only to students 18 and older, and that we only consider the book at issue tonight. All right, there's an amendment to the motion on the table. Do I have a second? Ms. Snipes. Any discussion to that, or should Mr. Hogan. Um, Kevin, I, I, I am going to disagree with this amendment, not for no other reason than the, the, what constitutes obscenity has no bearing whether a student's 18 or 17 or whether it's you or I checking out in the library. There's, there's rules in place that prohibit obscenity from inside a public library or a school library. And so whether the student's 18 or not, it's still, in my opinion, this constitutes obscenity. Ms. Snipes, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I asked what about the second part of the amendment for the whole series, which we so that's that, the amendment there. is what we're discussing right now. We're discussing Mr. Scully's amendment. We're not talking about the the the, um, the amendment was to remove the second part of Ms. Huddle's motion, which is the rest of the series, all of the other books in the series, and that's what Mr. Hogan was speaking to. Any other? Uh, 
I mean, I just have a comment on that. I think that uh, even if we do remove that part of Ms. Huddle's motion now, don't doubt that there will most likely be book challenges for the rest of the series because the later novels in this series are far, far more graphic. So mm -hmm. I would just make that comment um, regarding the, the later half of the series. Any other comments to the amendment? Seeing none, I will call for the vote on Mr. Scully's amendment. All in favor of Mr. Scully's amendment? All opposed? Abstaining, Mr. Satterfield. All right, that motion fails. And that brings us to the original motion on the floor. We have heard from the complainant, we have heard from the district, and we have heard from every board member. So, Mr. or Dr. Ross. As your superintendent, I have to, um, as the way this amendment, I mean, this uh, motion is made, there is no vehicle for the administration to, through policy, to consider a book that has not come through your KEC policy. So I'm just, I gotta put that on the table as your superintendent. You have a clear policy that says how these books come to this body. We're, we're considering one right now. If this motion passes, there is no mechanism through policy, unless I'm, I'm missing something. So I just wanted to state that. Okay, so I will call for the vote. All in favor of Ms. Mr. Satterfield. I'm sorry, could, could you give me a little more clarity on that, Dr. Ross? Uh, correct. The, if, if you look at uh, a lot of districts, there have been some districts had as many as 90 books that have gone through the policy, 80-something uh, books that have gone through the policy. Each one of those had to go through the KEC process, either variations of it as, as adopted by those local school boards. In those, uh, in those processes, they created, in some cases, 80-something committees. And those committees would review each one of the books to consider titles that have not come through the complainant process. We as the administration, I don't know how to move forward on that. So I just wanted to state that. I appreciate uh, that, Dr. Ross. I think that that's not what's before the board right now. I mean, the Ms. Ms. Huddle's motion is before the board. So if we want to reevaluate the policy KEC in the future, I think we do. But for purposes of this hearing, we have a motion on the floor um, we've heard from the district, we've heard from the complainant, and we've heard from every board member. So I would like to call for the vote at this. I don't want to go back and forth with all of the different um, board, board members. Clarity. Clarity, Mr. Hogan. So up here, I'm, I'm hearing Dr. Ross correct in, in the nature of Ms. Huddle's motion. It's to remove a court of mist and fury and the remaining books inside it, correct? But as far as our policy and the challenge of this book, only a court of Mr. Fury was reviewed through the first process of a formal book challenge, correct? That's correct. So if, and just here, I'm, I'm talking this out out loud as, as I'm building the plan as I'm flying it. So in the event, if, if a motion's passed to remove another book that has not gone through the first process of a, of a challenge, are we putting ourselves in a situation to where... Well, so, Mr. Hogan, I think if we're going to talk about um, any of those conversations, th that is a different conversation from this hearing. Um, I, I, I really do believe that, that um, we are... I've called for the motion, so I'm going to call for the vote, and I'm not trying to step on your toes, Mr. Hogan, but we've, we've got the motion on the floor. We could debate this back and forth, but that's not the purpose of this hearing tonight. Ms. Huddle made a motion. It was seconded. We've all discussed it, and I think that we all need, uh, we'll call for the vote, and it'll lie where it is, and if we have to readdress the conversation, then that's what we'll do. Ms. Huddle, will you read your motion? I didn't write it down. Um, so I don't know, did you guys write it down by any chance? Okay, I'll try to paraphrase um, what I said. Um, I move to support the complainant um, and remove the book, um, A Court of Mist and Fury, and all other books in the Court of Thorns and Roses series from all of our libraries. And I am calling for the vote. All in favor of Ms. Huddle's motion. All opposed to Ms. Huddle's motion. That motion carries five to two. And we will, we will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is 
the second and final reading approval of proposed revisions to board policy AE accountability commitment to accomplishment exhibit F. Uh, Madam Ross. Chair, yes, we bring for you for second and final reading proposed policy, uh, proposed uh, revisions to policy AE accountability commitment to accomplishment. Uh, as you're aware, we go through our accreditation in January and uh, ask that this help align the board's vision and mission with the school district's vision and mission. And uh, we bring this again for second reading. Do I have a motion? Yeah. Miss? I would like a motion um, that we approve the second and final reading of the proposed revisions to board policy AE, accountability, commitment to accomplishment. Do I have a second, I'll Mr. Second. Hogan? Any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That, Ms. Snipes. Okay, sorry, didn't see you. That motion carries six to zero. Uh, Mr. Scully has stepped out. That brings us to item 15, the approval of the proposed 2024-2025 school calendar exhibit G. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, we bring after discussion uh, our recommendation for approval option B calendar. Uh, for the proposed 2024-25 school year, and I'll have our Director of Communications, uh, Mr. Manitella, come forth with that presentation. The board, glad to be with you again um, to discuss the approval of the 2024-25 um, academic calendar for our district. Um, we presented two options um, at our last meeting for discussion, and after hearing your, your comments through those discussions, we went back to our parents' advisory and also principal advisories. Um, they expressed an overwhelming preference for option B um, based on the instructional value of that calendar, primarily being able to end the first semester at the winter break. Um, that allows all um, finals and midterms to be held prior to um, the winter break, and also for students who have semester classes, when they, come, when they return to school after winter break, they will start um, anew with their se second semester classes. So um, that was overwhelmingly preferred by particularly the secondary principals and parents that we, that we did talk to. Um, the other item in calendar B that was appealing to those groups were the additional teacher and student breaks in March and April. Spring break does occur late in the calendar next year, um, and so that will just allow some flexibility in those months, those long months, um, before we can get to spring break. So I'm happy to take any questions you have at this point um, regarding those calendars. Ms. Barnhart. Just to refresh my memory, was this the one that was voted on and um, the majority of the people who took the survey wanted, or was that A? No, ma'am. The survey results showed a 6% higher preference for option A. Okay, and then this was also the one that, um, to where the, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, the work was done before the end of the year so that the break, is that the same? Option, option B, B which is the administration's recommendation tonight, is the first semester will conclude, we'll conclude at winter break. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Satterfield. Yeah, um, I know we were given option A and B. Can you tell us how we get to the point of just having A or B? I, I like, as a second, former secondary person, I do like, again, for those middle of the road students mainly, uh, having the exams prior. I am concerned that we continue to start the school year earlier and earlier every year. Um, I, it was a trend that I had seen over the years, but it seems like we're really starting earlier. Can you, it, it, was, was there any other, were there, were this, did it, the committee just narrow it down to these two options and pretty much come to a consensus? 
Yes, sir. It, it seems that over the years, the preference has been to end the school year earlier in the spring to be out by the first part of June. Um, so that's kind of where that, you know. First week at the beach? Yes, sir. Pretty much, I understand. <laughs> no, so, you know, to end at one place, you have to, to start, you know, 180 days prior to that. But, right. um, that's okay. Kind of, that would, I just, yes, I was sir. just curious how we, um, Again, I do like having this in the semester, you know, ending before the kids go home, but uh, I am concerned that we keep pushing that start date back early and early, and it really causes parents to adjust their summer plans and kids with summer jobs and things like that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Mr. Satterfield, I agree with you. I mean, summer camps run through middle of August. Um, for kids, so I mean, I, I have a, this is no secret, I have a major issue with us starting at the beginning of August, um, especially if we're not even talking about adjusting the starting age of a kindergartner. You have um, children that will be four, um, that, I mean, my child started, and I'm not making this about just my child, but my child started kindergarten at the age of four and her birthday is at the end of August and and that's a struggle and you're required to start school you can't hold your child back if they're in that age range um, so if we're telling you know parents that they have to have their four-year-old start at the beginning of August that, I mean that is a, a struggle um, I don't know if we're having those conversations my other concern that I have with this uh, is, you know, we put out a survey and to kind of gauge where we are, and then we, we don't really go with the majority of the survey. We go to just the, um, I mean, I'm seeing that the parent advisory committees, their recommendation, and, and, I'm, and I know several people on the PAC, and, and I respect that, but I think one of the, I've asked about that um, conversation, and I think that there was a big concern about the, to Mr. Satterfield's point, the exams before the holidays, it's my understanding that in some schools, a lot of teachers have the exams before the holidays anyways. So um, they're wrapping up the, the end of the semester going into January, but that most of the exams are happening right now. That may be a one-off from some folks that I've, you know, that have students at different school, high schools in our, um, in our district, but, I really, I, I have concerns starting the year so um, so early. I think that we are trying to circumvent state law on, on, on some level. I mean, the only way that we can do that is to have a modified year-round schedule. So if we're actually trying to go to a year-round schedule, we should actually say that that's what we're doing. Um, I've asked that question and I feel like the response is, well, we're not doing that, we're not doing that right now, but if we're slowly trying to do that, so we get to the point where it's easier to say that we're going to do a year-round schedule, I think that we need to, we need, that, that's what the conversation needs to be. Um, we shouldn't be moving the, every year, the school year up by another week or another two weeks. That's just my thoughts. Anyone else? Uh, do we need a motion to approve the, Mr. Scully? Yeah, I just want to catch up. I stepped out. This is for the vote on the calendar. Yep. Yes. <sighs> Ms. Taylor, are you for it? You're for the Plan B recommendation? The district's recommendation is option B. Yes, sir. Okay. Ms. McCaskill, are you for this recommendation? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. I was hoping to have missed that vote, but thank you. Yeah. I know. Do I have a motion? Yes. Ms. Oh. Snipes. I'd like to make a motion that we support the administration's recommendation of option B for the year-round modified academic calendar. Do I have a second? Mr. Hogan. All right. Any more discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of Ms. Snipes' motion? All opposed? Motion carries six to one. Another year, I'm now voted, and it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> All right. Um, that brings us to item 16, the first reading approval of proposed revisions to board policy, IKE promotion and retention of students exhibit H. Can I get a motion before the discussion, please? Mr. Hogan. 
Make a motion the board approves the first reading of proposed revisions to board policy IKE promotion and retention of students. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Snipes. All right. Dr. Ross. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Members of the board, we bring to you our chief of academics, uh, Ms. Tina McCaskill, to uh, bring our first reading approval of uh, proposed revisions to board policy IKE promotion and retention of students. Ms. McCaskill. Good evening. Um, nice to see all of you again. Uh, and I'm here to talk about the first reading. Again, the only changes here are the numbers of courses that a child needs to be identified as a sophomore, junior, or senior, and it will be phased in. So it'll be for the ninth graders this year, and then each year we'll add another year. So it'll be phased in to align with what the state um, requirements are. If there's any questions. Any questions? All right, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? That motion carries six to zero. Ms. Barnhart has stepped out. Thank you, Ms. Thank McCaskill. You. That brings us to item 17, the renewal of District 5's Foundation of Ex Educational Excellence Incorporated Memorandum of Understanding and Agreement in Exhibit I. Do I have a motion, Mr. Hogan? Make the motion the board renews the renewal of District of Foundation of Education Excellence Incorporated Memorandum of Understanding and Agreement. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Snipes. Dr. Ross. All right. Lynn, I'll ask you to come forward and uh, speak to the motion, please. I was about to say, wow, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so good evening, everyone. I know it's been a long night for, all you, for you all, but um, it, as always, it's an honor to come and speak before you on behalf of the District 5 Foundation and our partnership with the district. Um, it is that time of year that we renew our memorandum of understanding and agreement, and we as a foundation could not function adequately without the clerical support and the web support, as well as everything else that's stipulated in our memorandum of understanding. So we certainly appreciate that. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the support to the students and staff of the district so all of their needs can be met. Along those lines, I wanted to give you a quick update on where the foundation stands as of today on our goals. Unfortunately, our fall fundraiser was not as profitable as we had hoped this year. Um, we raised uh, under $30,000 when we had a goal much higher than that, of course. Um, as a result, we've had to postpone the disbursement of our teacher grants um, until we can come up with some other creative fundraising ideas. They're not gone, they're just postponed. We had around $50,000 in grant monies requested by our teachers, and we're looking to find creative ways to fund at least parts of all of those um, applicants, grant applicants. Our biggest challenge at the moment is our snack pack funds which are quickly dwindling, as we've heard so much today, about our um, impoverished students and our students who have food needs. Um, we, as a result, we had to move some of our funds from our emergency fund to our snack pack fund just to cover the cost of our next round of checks that will be going out. So we need your help. Um, first, any and all donations are welcome. As always, you can visit our website Second, an easy way to send in a donation is to recognize an educator with a $5 donation to the website as, as, I'm sorry, to the foundation as part of our Five for Five or as our Christmas card campaign that started uh, this week. So, um, and lastly, we have partnered with a local business, so I hope everyone can join us at BJ's on Harbison Boulevard on December the 21st. Hope you can take a break from shopping between noon and 9 p.m. We, they gave us a nine hour window for this fundraising event. The foundation will be receiving a donation of 20% of all food and non-alcoholic beverage uh, purchases for every special flyer that is presented. It's good for in restaurant as well as takeout. Flyers are posted on our Facebook page and I believe, did we print some for the district office? There are some available in the district office. Um, so hope everybody can come out to BJ's and it's a great easy way for us to make some, some great money for our snack pack program. So enjoy a meal and help others, help feed others at the same time. So thank you for your time tonight. Uh, we look forward to our continued partnership um, and I would welcome any questions if you have any. Do I have any questions, Mr. Scully? Can you repeat the hours on the 21st? Sure, it's from noon until 9 p.m. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions? All right, seeing none, we have a motion on the floor. I'll call for the vote. All in favor? All opposed? Abstaining? All right, so that motion carries five with two abstains, two abstaining. Abstentions, abstains, sorry, abstentions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. It's getting late, guys. <laughs> All right.